Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendez. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings, and today we are not talking about the Age of Reptiles mural by Rudolf F. Salinger at the Peabody Museum of Natural History, which measures 110 feet long by 16 feet high, which I'm sure you all know because I'm sure you all can read, because right now we're on kids.britannica.com, and, well, I'm showing the mural. Why am I showing this mural? Well, aside from the fact that this is a mural from a book that I wish I could do for you but can't because I don't know where my copy went, but I think my parents gave it away, um, this is one of the really awesome pieces of museum art that isn't in art museums. Uh, this is showing off the age of the dinosaurs in what was accurate in 1943 through 47 scientifically to dinosaurs. This is this is the Jurassic Park reconstruction of dinosaurs of the 1940s. So you have up here, this is the Cretaceous, and you have an Ankylosaur, and a T-Rex, and a Triceratops, and over here you have what is probably a Brontosaur, and a Stegosaurus, and I don't remember what that is because it's been a very long time since I read the book, but I think that that was probably a Pachycephalosaurus. And there are some Camarasaurs. Um, and my computer likes to pretend it's a tablet, as I'm sure you've all had to put up with at some point. And back here we have some, uh, we have a Dimetrodon and an Adathosaur and a thing that I don't know what it's called because I don't know that much about um, Permian reptiles. So, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because today's book, The Dinosaur Heresies by Bob Bakker, is about turning this old view of dinosaurs on its head. And this is a big book because this is a book that marks a shift that took place during my lifetime. And it's a shift that people who were born in the 90s, people who have been born in the 2000s, really aren't aware of and don't understand. And the shuffling in the background is rabbits, which you may or may not someday see video of. Um, so this shift had to do with dinosaurs as sluggish, slow, cold-blooded creatures, um, and being basically the same as Dimetrodons, and having that shift to the dinosaurs of, well, from Jurassic Park. And the thing is that that, oh, there it goes, tableting again. Um, this view here of a dynamic T-Rex and what is probably a Styracosaur, um, on the cover of the Dinosaur Heresies, that view of dinosaurs required basically a massive revolution that started during the 70s and happened over the course of the 80s and 90s. And that that is a, a sharp, bright line between before and after. Um, Science a lot of times undergoes sharp lines of before and after. The line before which everybody believed this thing was so, and the line after which everyone believed the other thing was so. And those lines usually change how you see a whole sector of the world. In the case of dinosaurs, it took that shift of dinosaurs from being the ginormous lizards that might be in some way related to birds and took them into being the animals that became birds and evolved into birds. Bob Bakker's book presages this. Bob Bakker was among the driving forces of people who came up with this idea of warm-blooded, active, bird-like dinosaurs. And this book is... The book where he, in response to uh, one of his mentors, who had once told him, Kid, you can't go on being an enfant terrible forever. you got to write a book. And uh, the thing is that um, 
he took that advice and uh, Bakker took that advice and wrote this book. And he illustrated it. So all of the illustrations, except for this cover, which I have absolutely no credits for, so don't ask because I don't know. I can't find it. I don't know if the pages fell out or if nobody bothered to credit the person who did this or if it was even Bob Bakker displaying unexpected painting talents. Um, the illustrations, however, are are all by Bob Bakker. Like this one. This is one of the earliest illustrations in the book, and uh, that is of, if I recall correctly, because, oh, here it is, the Megalosaurus um, attacking a sea crocodile, Teleosaurus. And this is a very different view from what people thought dinosaurs were before. And there was a lot of talk about dinosaurs, about, um, if we go back to this, you can see here that there is a, a sauropod waist deep in water, or elbow deep. That's because at the time everybody thought that sauropods were so heavy that they could not hold themselves up outside of water. We now know better, but at the time, this picture here of a Deinonychus attacking um, uh, some kind of overraptor like uh, um, or, or, you know, one of the ostrich-like dinosaurs that's not a, a um, carnivore. Um, this sort of thing was believed for a very long time to just be, you know, crazy talk. A feathered Deinonychus. But this feathered Deinonychus probably looks totally normal to a lot of people now. But for someone like me who grew up with dinosaurs being slow and reptilian... This still looks weird, and it will always look weird, because I lived through that shift between the before and after. And it's something that you need to understand. Now, the um, thing about, that makes this book so good, aside from some of its awesome illustrations, is that it explains paleontology. It explains how paleontology works, how you come to decisions about what dinosaurs were like or looked like or acted like. It comes, it explains how the discovery, the understanding that dinosaurs were warm-blooded came about. This is just an illustration of the temperature difficulties that uh, ectotherms, that is cold-blooded animals, have. Um, that there is if they get too cold, then they enter a torpor. There's a spot right in the middle where they have this ideal temperature. And that if they get too hot, they get brain addled. And their feet stick up in the air and their tongues stick out of their mouths and their eyes turn into little X's. Because, you know, that's what happens when you fall over. Um, and so you have humorous pictures like this which is Bob Bakker's illustration of the question of the issue that if dinosaurs were all cold-blooded then why didn't the mammals just take over then because anytime things got a little bit cold all of the dinosaurs would have fallen over and the mammals would have run amok but they didn't for 200 million years they didn't so he asked the question how come and this book traces all of the things that he used to figure out that dinosaurs must have been warm-blooded and how he figured it out. But it also talks about the process of paleontology. And we see here a Diplodocus, which has, as he shows here, the nostrils on the top of its head in the same position that the nostril entry for an elephant that elephants, their nostril entries in the skull are actually on top of their heads, and they have trunks. And tapers, which have nostril entries sort of midway from where we suggest think the end of the nose is, midway between that and the top of the head, that's where their noses are, and they have semi-trunks. And 
things like this, comparing an animal then to an animal now, are how you come up with paleontological theories. And so he came up with the he threw out the offhand idea that maybe Diplodocus had a trunk. Now, he goes on to suggest, of course, that that was more, far more likely some kind of noise-making apparatus because a great many of the animals, um, such as this Corythosaurus and a Parasaurolophus above, have, you know, uh, things on top of their heads which they would have used, like, trombones or horns to make exciting trumpety noises. But uh, I grew up with people believing that the Parasaurolophus thing was a snorkel. That it would swim with that and that would poke up out of the water and it would breathe through it. And I gotta tell you, it's still a pretty cool theory even if everything about it has been disproven. And he goes into chapter and verse of how people came to believe that the duckbills were semi-aquatic, and how it is that you disprove that they're semi-aquatic. And I have here something which, this is predicting cladistics. And now, cladistics is kind of, in short, the study of how animals evolved from uh, what they were before into how they are now sort of the branching tree of uh, species relationships. That is, you have birds which came from earlier dinosaur, earlier birds such as the Archaeopteryx, but the Archaeopteryx sp split off and uh, evolved into three different things, modern birds, but also the Hesperornis and the Ichthyornis, which are two... Uh, dinosaur-era birds that have since gone extinct. That the Archaeopteryx came out of the Dromaeosaurs, and the Dromaeosaurs were part of a group that had split um, into the Tyrannosaurids, Ornithomimids, Allosaurs, and that as you go back, you find that each of these species was from a certain species which branched off into a bunch of other ones, and cladistics is kind of the study of that. Um, and it's a relatively recent invention because, of course, most of us have grown up knowing about kingdom, phylum, order, and family, and species. But that particular means of sorting animals dated back to uh, before we knew evolution was a thing. It dated back to when everything, when they were trying to figure out where all the animals were in the great scheme of life. Um, in that caste-oriented way of viewing, uh, th that way of viewing where or how animals all had their places in the same way that people all had their places. If you were born a peasant, then God had meant you to be a peasant. And if a bird was born a bird, then that bird wasn't going to someday give birth to the lineage of other weirder birds. Um, and with Linnaeus, uh, not Linnaeus, um, Oh, God, I can't remember his name. Uh, there, Lamarck, that was it. Lamarck came up with an idea of evolution, but it wasn't accurate. And then Darwin came up with his idea of evolution, which remains how we see evolution today. So, and so what we got from Bob Bakker was Jurassic Park. We got dynamic dinosaurs. We got drama. We got action. And I recommend this book because it helps you understand paleontology. It helps you understand where the modern view of dinosaurs came from. And it helps you understand how it is anybody could have ever believed that birds hadn't evolved from dinosaurs. So... I recommend it, because yes, it's out of date. Yes, it's from 1986, and it's still a great, useful, interesting book.